Hi, welcome back, guys. We are reading Coraline. It's so far we've met Coraline, our parents, our mom, which is mom and dad, her neighbors, the two ladies that live downstairs, the old man that lives upstairs, his mice. It's like kind of weird, right? And the cat. And then we also met other mother and other father. Uh, she gets to see those guys by going through a tunnel that she found in her house. And when she goes to that side where other mother and other father is, the same cat that she sees in her house is there. But on that side, it talks to her. Uh, and when it stopped, she was falling asleep on the other side, not her normal side, because the other mother took her parents and had them trapped. So now she's going to try to figure out how to get her parents untrapped and save everyone, huh? All right, so we are on chapter... Six. Coraline was woke was woken by the mid-morning sun full on her face. For a moment, she felt utterly dislocated. She did not know where she was. She was not entirely sure who she was. It is astonishing just how much of what we are can be tied to the beds we wake up in in the morning. It is astounding how fragile that can be. Sometimes for Coraline would forget who she was, and while she was daydreaming that she was exploring the Arctic or the Amazon rainforest or darkest Africa, and it was not until someone tapped her on the shoulder or said her name that Coraline would come back from a million miles away. With a start and all, of the, and all in a fraction of a second have to remember who she was and what her name was, and that she was even there at all. Now, there was sun on her face, and she was Coraline Jones. Yes, and then the green and pinkness of the room she was in, and the rustling of large painted papers, butter, large sorry, rustling of a large painted paper butterflies as it fluttered and beat its way about the ceiling. Told her, she had woken up. She climbed out of bed. She could not wear her pajamas, dressing gown, and slippers during the day. She decided, even if it meant wearing the other Coraline's clothes. Was there another Coraline? No, she realized there wasn't. There was just her. There was no regular clothes in the cupboard, though they were more like dress dressing up clothes, or she thought the kind of clothes she would love to have hanging in her own wardrobe at home. There was a raggedy witch costume, a patched scarecrow costume, a future warrior costume with little digital lights in, in it that glittered and blinked, a slinky evening dress all co covered in feathers and mirrors, and finally, in a drawer, she found a pair of black jeans that seemed to be made of velvet night. And a gray sweater with the color of thick smoke, with the faint tiny stars in the fabric which twinkled. She pulled on the jeans and the sweater, and then put on a pair of bright orange boots she found at the bottom of the cupboard. She took her last apple out of her pocket of her dressing gown, and then took from the same pocket the stone with a hole in it. She put the stone into the pocket of her jeans, and it was as if her head had cleared a little and she had come out of a sort of a fog. She went into the kitchen, but it was deserted. Still, she was sure that there was someone in the flat. She walked down the hall until she reached her father's study and discovered that it was occupied. Where's the other mother, she asked the other father. He was sitting in the study at a desk which looked like her father's, but he was not doing anything at all, not even reading, gardening catalogs as her own father did when he was only pretending to be working. Out, he told her, fixing the doors. There are some vermin problems. He seemed pleased to have somebody to talk to. The rats, you mean? No, the rats are our friends. It's the other kind, big black fella with, a, with his tail high. The cat, you mean? That's the one, said her other father. He looked less like her true father today. There was something slightly vague about his face, like bread dough, and it had begun to rise in something out of the bumps and cracks of depressions and depressions. Really, I mustn't talk to you, and she's not here, he said. But don't worry. Don't you worry. She won't be gone often. I shall demonstrate our tender hospitality to you such as such that you will not even think about ever going back. He closed his eyes, sorry, he closed his mouth and folded his hands in his lap. What am I to do now, asked Coraline. The other father pointed to his lips, silence. If you want, if you won't even talk to me, said Coraline, I'm going exploring. No point, said the other father, there isn't any, anything anywhere but here. 
This is all she made, the house, the grounds, and the people in the house. She made it, and she waited. Then he looked embarrassed, and he put one finger to his lips again, as if he had just said too much. Coraline walked out of the study. She went into the drawing room over, the, over to the old door and was pulling it, and she pulled it, rattled and shook it. No, it was locked fast, and the other mother had the key. She looked around the room. It was so familiar that what's... That was what made it feel so truly strange. Everything was exactly the same as she remembered. There were all her grandmother's strange-smelling furniture. There was the painting of the bowl of fruit, a bunch of grape, two plums, a peach, and an apple. Hanging on the wall, there was a low wooden table with the lion's feet and an empty fireplace which seemed to suck heat from the, from the room. But there was something else, something she did not remember seeing before. A ball of glass up on a mantelpiece. She went over to the fireplace, went up on tiptoes, and lifted it down. It was a snow globe with two little people in it. Coraline shook it and then set the snow flying. What? <coughs> Sorry, white snow gl glittered as it rumbled through the water. Then she put the globe, snow globe, back on the mantelpiece, carried on looking for her true parents, and for her way out. <coughs> she went out of the flat, past the flashing light doors, behind which the other Mrs. Spinks and Forcible performed their show forever, and she set off into the woods where Coraline came from. Once you were there, once you, once you were through the patch of trees, you saw nothing but the meadow and the old tennis courts. In this place, the woods went on farther, the trees becoming cruder and less tree-like like the farther you went. Soon, Pretty soon they seemed to... Uh, seemed very approximate, like the idea of trees, a gray brownish trunk below a greenish plodge of something that might have been leaves above. Coraline wondered if the other mother wasn't interested in trees, or if she just hadn't bothered with this bit of property because nobody was expected to come out this far. She kept walking. And then the mist began. It was not damp, like a normal fog or mist. It was not cold. It was not warm. It felt like it felt to Coraline like she was walking into something. I'm an explorer, thought Coraline to herself, and I need all the ways out of here that I can get, so I shall keep walking. The world she was walking through was a pile of nothingness, like a blank piece, blank sheet of paper or an enormous empty white room. It had no temperature, no smell, no texture, no taste. It certainly isn't mist, thought Coraline, although she did know what she did not know what it was. For a moment, she wondered if she might not have gone blind, but she could see herself plain as day, but there was no ground beneath her feet, just a misty, milky whiteness. And what do you think you're doing, said a sharp, said a shape to one side of her. It took a few moments for her eyes to focus on it properly. She thought it might be some kind of line at first, some distance away from her, and then she thought it might be a mouse close behind her. And then she knew what it was. I'm exploring, Coraline told the cat. Its fur stood straight out from its body as if it were, and its eyes were wide, while its tail was down between its legs. It did not look like a happy cat. Bad place, said the cat. If you want to call it a place, which I don't, what are you doing here? I'm exploring. Nothing to find here, said the cat. This is just the outside, the part of the place she hasn't bothered to create. She... The one who says she's your other mother, said the cat. What is she? asked Coraline. The cat did not answer, just padded through the pale mist behind Coraline. A shape began to appear in front of them, something high and towering and dark. You were wrong, she told the cat. There is something here. And then it took shape in the mist, a dark house, which loomed at them out of the formless whiteness. But that's, said Coraline. The house you just left, agreed the cat. Precisely. Maybe I just got turned around in the mist, said Coraline. The cat curled the high tip of its tail into question mark and tipped its head to one side. You might have done, it said. I certainly would not. Wrong, indeed. But how can we, how can you walk away from something and still come back to it? Easy, said the cat. Think of somebody walking around the world. You start out walking away from something, and in the end, coming back to it. Small world, said Coraline. It's big enough for her, said the cat. Spider webs only have to be large enough to catch flies. Coraline shivered. 
He said that she's fixing all the gates and doors, she told the cat, to keep you out. She may try, said the cat, unimpressed. Oh, yes, she may try. They were standing under a clump of trees now, beside the house. The trees looked much more likely. There's ways in and ways out of places like this that even she doesn't know about. Did she make this place then? asked Coraline. Made it, found it, what's the difference? asked the cat. Either way, she had it a very long time. Hang on. And it gave a shiver and a leap before Coraline could blink. The cat was sitting with his paws holding back down a big black rat. It's not that I like rats at the best of times, said the cat conversationally, as if nothing had happened. But the rats in this place are all spies for her. She uses them as her eyes and hands. And with that, the cat let the rat go. It ran several feet, and then the cat, with one bound, was upon it, batting it hard with one sharp clawed paw. While with the other paw, it held the rat down. I love this bit, says the cat happily. Want to see me do that again? No, said Coraline. Why do you do it? You're torturing it. Hmm, said the cat, and he let the rat go. The rat stumbled, dazed for a few steps, and then it began to run. With a blow of its paw, the cat knocked the rat into the air and caught it in its mouth. Stop it, said Coraline. The cat dropped the rat between its two front paws. There are those, it said with a sigh in tones as smooth as oiled silk, who have suggested that the tendency of a cat to play with its prey is a merciful one. After all, it permits the occasional funny little running snack to escape from time to time. How often does your dinner get to escape? And then it picked the rat up in its mouth and carried it off into the woods behind a tree. Coraline walked back into the house, and all was quiet and empty and deserted. Even her footsteps on the carpeted floor seemed loud. Dust motes hung in the beams of sunlight. At the far end of the hall was the mirror. She could see herself walking towards the mirror, looking reflected a little braver than she actually felt. There was nothing else there in the mirror, just her in the corridor. A hand touched her shoulder, and she looked up. The other mother stared down at Coraline with big black button eyes. Coraline, my dollar, darling, she said. I thought we c I thought we could play some games together this morning. Now, you're back from your walk, hopscotch, happy families, monopoly. You weren't in the mirror, said Coraline. The other mother smiled. Mirrors, she said, are never to be trusted. Now, what game shall we play? Coraline shook her head. I don't want to play with you, she said. I want to go home and be with my real parents. I want you to let them go and to let us all go. The other mother shook her head very slowly. Sharper than a serpent's tooth, she said, is a daughter's ingratitude. Still, the proudest spirit can be broken with love, and her long white fingers waggled and caressed the air. I have no plans to love you, said Coraline, no matter what. You can't make me love you. Let's talk about it, said the other mother, and she turned and walked into the lounge. Coraline followed her. The other mother sat down on the big sofa. She picked up a shopping bag from beside the sofa and took out a white rustling paper bag from it. She extended the hand with it to Coraline. Would you like one? She asked politely, expecting it to be toffee or butterscotch ball. Coraline looked down. The bag was half filled with large, shiny black beetles crawling over each other in their efforts to get out of the bag. No, said Coraline, I don't want one. Yeah. Suit yourself, said the other mother. She carefully picked up the, picked out a peculiar, peculiar, yeah, large and black beetle, pulled off its leg, which she dropped neatly into the big glass ashtray on the side, on the small table beside the sofa, and popped the beetle into her mouth. She crunched it happily. Yum, she said, and took another. You're sick, said Coraline, sick and evil and weird. Is that any way to talk to your mother? Her other mother asked with her mouth full of black beetles. You aren't my mother, said Coraline. Her other mother ignored this. Now, I think you are a little overexcited, Coraline. Perhaps this afternoon we could do a little embroidery together or some watercolor painting. Then dinner, and then if you have been good, you may play with the rats a little before bed. And I shall read you a story and tuck you in and kiss you good night. Her long white fingers fluttered gently like a tired butterfly, and Coraline shivered. No, said Coraline. The other mother sat on the sofa. Her mouth was set with a line. Her lips were pursed. 
She popped another black beetle into her mouth and then another, like someone with a bag of chocolate-covered raisins. Her big black button eyes stared into Coraline's hazel eyes. Her shiny black hair twined and twisted about her neck and shoulders, as if it were blowing in some wind that Coraline could not touch or feel. They stared at each other for over a minute. Then the other mother said, Manners. She folded the white paper bag carefully so no black beetles could escape, and then she placed it back in the shopping bag. Then she stood up and up and up. She seemed taller than Coraline remembered. She reached into her apron, po apron pocket and pulled out first a black door key, which she frowned at and tossed on into her shopping bag, and then a tiny silver-colored key. She helped it, held it up triumphantly. There we are, she said. This is for you, Coraline. For your own good, because I love you. To teach you manners, manners maketh the man, after all. She poured Coraline back into the hallway and advanced upon the mirror at the end of the hall. Then she pushed the tiny key into the fabric of the mirror and twisted it. It opened like a door, revealing dark space behind it. You may come out when you have learned some manners, said the other mother, and when you're ready to be a loving daughter. She picked up Coraline and pushed her into the dim space behind the mirror. The fragment of beetle was sticking to her lower lip, and there was no expression at all in her black button eyes. Then she swung the mirror door closed and left Coraline in the darkness. All right, so that's the end of that chapter. So we learned that the world that the other mother created is only the house and a little bit of the grounds and woods. Once you leave it, you get this like white nothingness, and then... You go back into the, uh, you just find the house again. You just keep walking. We also found that the rats are spies, and the cat likes to play with them and eat them, but they are spies, so she has to be careful around them. And the other mother eats beetles, which is disgusting. And at the end, what did she do to Coraline? She pushed her behind them, like opened a weird mirror thing and pushed her behind it into the darkness and told her when she can learn manners and be a loving daughter, she will let her out. Okay, interesting. Chapter seven. Somewhere inside her, Coraline could feel a huge sob swelling up, welling up, and then she stopped it. Before it came out, she took a deep breath and let it go. She put out her hands to touch the space in which she was, in, was imprisoned. It was the size of a broom closet tall enough to stand in or to sit in, not wide enough or deep enough to lie down in. One wall was glass, and it felt cold to the touch. She went around the tiny room a second time, running her hands over every surface that she could reach, feeling for doorknobs or switches or concealed catches, some kind of way out, and found nothing. A spider scuffled over the back of her hand, and she choked back a shriek, but apart from the spider, the, she was alone in the closet in the pitch dark. And then her hand touched something that felt for, for all the world like somebody's cheek and lips, small and cold, and a voice whispered in her ear, Hush and shush, say nothing, for the bedlam might be listening. Coraline said nothing. She felt a cold hand touch her face, fingers running over it like the gentle beat of a moth's wing. Another voice, hesitant and so faint, Coraline wondered if she were imagining it, said, Art thou... Art thou alive? Yes, whispered Coraline. Poor child, said the first voice. Who are you? whispered Coraline. Names, 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 said another voice, all far away and lost. The names are the first things to go after the, after the breath has gone and the beating of the heart. We keep our memories longer than our names. I still keep pictures in my mind of my governess on some May morning carrying my hoop and stick and in the morning sun behind her and all the tulips bobbing in the breeze. But I've forgotten the name of my governess and of the tulips, too. I don't think tulips have names, said Coraline. They're just tulips. Perhaps, said the voice sadly, but I've always thought that, those, that these tulips must have had names. They were red and orange. They were red and orange and red and red and orange and yellow, like the embers in the nursery's fire on a, wood, on a winter's evening. I remember them. The voice sounded so sad that Coraline put her hand it to, out to the place where the voice was coming from, and she found a cold hand. She squeezed it tightly. 
Her eyes were beginning to get used to the darkness. Now Coraline saw, or imagined she saw, three shapes, each as faint and pale as the moon in the daytime sky. They were the shapes of children about her own size. The cold hand squeezed her hand back. Thank you, said the voice. Are you a girl, asked Coraline, or a boy? There was a pause. When I was small, I wore skirts and my hair was long and curled, I said doubtfully. But now that you ask, it does seem to me that one day they took my skirts and gave me britches and cut my hair. Taint something we give mi give a mind to, said the first of the voices. A boy, perhaps, then, continued the one whose hand she was holding. I believe I was a boy, and it glowed a little more brightly in the darkness of the room behind the mirror. What happened to you all? asked Coraline. How did you come here? She left us here, said one of the voices. She stole our hearts, and she stole our souls, and she took our lives away. And she left us here, and she forgot about us in the dark. You poor thing, said Coraline. How long have you been here? So very long a time, said a voice. I time beyond reckoning, said another voice. I walked through the scullery door, said the voice of the one that thought it might be a boy, and I found myself back in the parlor. But she was waiting for me. She told me she was my other mama, but I never saw my true mama again. Flee, said the first voice, of, said the very first of the voices. Another girl, girl, Coraline fancied. Flee while there's still air in your lungs and blood in your veins and warmth in your heart. Flee while you still have your mind and your soul. I'm not running away, said Coraline. She has my parents. I came to get them back. Ah, uh, but she'll keep you here while the days draw... Days turn to dust and leaves fall, and the years pass one after the next, like the tick, tick, ticking of a clock. No, said Coraline. She won't. There was silence then in the room behind the mirror. Peradventure, said a voice in the darkness, if you could win your mama and your papa back from the bedlam, you could also win for your souls. Has she taken them, said Coraline, shocked? Aye, and hidden them. That is why we could not leave here. When we died, she kept us and fed us and fed on us until now there's nothing left of ourselves, only snake skins and spider husks. Find our secret heart, young mistress. And that will and that will happen to you if you don't ask what will happen to you if I don't? If I do, sorry, asked Coraline. The voice that said nothing. And what's she going to do to me? she said. The pale fingers pulsed faintly. She could imagine that there was nothing more than after images, like the glow left by a bright light in your eyes after the lights go out. It doth not hurt, whispered one faint voice. She will take your life and all you are and all you cares for, and she will leave you with nothing but mist and fog. She'll take your joy, and one day you'll wake up and your heart and your soul will have gone. A husk you'll be, a wisp you'll be, and things no more than a dream on waking or a memory of something forgotten. Hollow, whispered the voice. Hollow, 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 hollow. You must flee, sighed a voice faintly. I don't think so, said Coraline. I tried running away and it didn't work. She just took my parents. Can you tell me how to get out of this room? If we knew, then we would tell you. Poor thing, said Coraline to herself. She sat down. She took off her sweater and rolled it up and put it behind her head as a pillow. She won't keep me in the dark forever, said Coraline. She brought me here to play games, games and challenges, the cat said. I'm not much of a challenge here in the dark. She tried to get comfortable twisting and bending herself to fit. The cramped space behind the mirror. Her stomach rumbled and she ate her last apple, taking the tiniest bites, making it last as long as she could. When she had finished, she was still hungry. Then the idea struck her and she whispered, when she comes to let me out, why don't you three come with me? We wish that we could, they sighed to her, and in their barely their voices, but she has our hearts in our keeping. Now we belong to the dark and empty places. The lights would shrivel us and burn. Oh, said Coraline. She closed her eyes, which made the darkness darker, and she rested her head on the rolled up sweater, and she went to sleep, and she and as she fell asleep she thought she felt a ghost kiss her cheek tenderly, and the small voice whispered into her ear, a voice so faint it was barely there at all, a gentle wispy nothing of a voice, so hushed that Coraline could almost believe she was imagining it. Look through the song, it said to her, and then she slept. Okay, so that's the end of that chapter. Um, so she's trapped behind a mirror, and she meets somewhat.
So you have some other kids and they have no heart and soul. Who took them? The other mother. She called them, they called her in a bedlam and they said that she's the other mother. Um, so she fell asleep and as she fell asleep, they gave her a little bit of advice. What was that advice? <clears throat> Look through the stone. Remember, she has that little stone that she was given that has the hole in it. So look through the stone. And we're going to go one more chapter, maybe. Nope, we'll read that next time. So that's where we're going to stop today. Um, we're coming down to the end of this book. So until next time, see you guys.